What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And on this Tuesday in the third week of Lent, we're continuing on through the Gospel of Mark in chapter 9. We've got an incredible quote from Martin Luther and, of course, our ongoing catechesis, this time on the petition, Thy Kingdom Come. Stick around. <music> So there's an ebb and flow to what we've been reading. Sometimes it's pretty cool to watch Jesus do all of these miracles and to know that he's the great healer, the great physician, the great caster out of demons, the great teacher, the great feeder of the multitudes, the one who has proclaimed that he has come to give his life as a ransom for many. But sometimes Jesus is relatively harsh, and this is going to be one of those times. So we continue in the Gospel of Mark Chapter 9, beginning at verse 33. And they came to Capernaum, and when Jesus was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now this is a relatively harsh teaching of Jesus. Lots of harsh, harsh teachings of Jesus, uh, I think. First of all, the shock for the disciples that, oh, you want to be the greatest? Then you better be prepared to be a slave and a servant. And I think that's good advice for the church uh, in this, this time of, of crisis and pandemic. If we want to be the church, then we need to serve our neighbor. If there's a neighbor, someone you know, someone who can't maybe go out and buy provisions or groceries or, heaven forbid, toilet paper, you go. You go. Serve. Love by serving. Be great by being humble. And this is a big shock to the disciples because what does Jesus always talk about? His kingdom, his glory. Well, they want to share in that. Cool. Share in that by serving. This teaching about causing a little one who believes in Jesus to sin. Now, we're, we're not going to talk about how this little one in this text was a very, very little one. Uh, so yes, even uh, infants and children uh, can believe but Jesus is saying, oh, woe to you who teaches falsely and causes a little one to fall away from me. And Jesus also tells us, if anything were to cause us to sin, to rip it from our body, cut off your hand, gouge out your eye, cut off your feet. Now, we, we don't do this. But as we come closer and closer to Holy Week, as we on the other side of the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus already know the story, we see the sinless Son of God giving his flesh to torment, seeing his flesh ripped out, 
seeing his eyes bruised shut, seeing him scourged and nailed and crowned with thorns and hung in our place, bearing this brutality to the flesh, and on top of that, drinking the cup of wrath which his Father has given to him to drink. Jesus has done this too for us. And so, in response to this, because Christ has set us free from sin, we are free not to mortify our flesh. His flesh was already mortified for us. We are free to flee from that which would cause us to sin. Now, I'm really excited about this, this writing from Martin Luther um, because I think it, it drives at a lot of the problems with which uh, mainline Protestants have with the concept of baptism. So we begin. Why should we see the blood of Christ in baptism? Because this holy baptism was purchased for us through this same blood, which he shed for us and with which he paid for sin. This blood and its merit and power he put into baptism, in order that in baptism we might receive it. For whenever a person receives baptism in faith, this is the same as if he were visibly washed and cleansed from sin with the blood of Christ. For we do not attain the forgiveness of sins through our work, but rather through the death and the shedding of the blood of the Son of God. But he takes this forgiveness of sins and tucks it into baptism. This is what St. John was looking to when he mingled water and blood together. For after all, it was in it that which was gained through the blood. And thus John deems the person who is baptized as having been washed in the blood of Christ. His blood is not that of a sinful man or the blood of a dead goat or ox. It is innocent, just, and holy. It is a blood of life. Therefore, it also contains such strong salt and soap that wherever it touches sin and uncleanliness, it bites it and washes it all away, eats and destroys both sin and death in an instant. Thus St. John pictures our dear baptism for us in this way, so that we shall not regard and look only at the clear water, for he says Christ comes not with water only, as the Anabaptists blaspheme, saying it is nothing but water, but with the water and the blood, 1 John 5, 6. Through such word he desires to admonish us to see with spiritual eyes and see in baptism the beautiful, rosy red blood of Christ, which flowed and poured from his holy side. And therefore he calls those who have been baptized none other than those who have been bathed and cleansed in this same rosy red blood of Christ. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, say what you will about Martin Luther, the man is brilliant. Now, we continue on on this Tuesday in the third week of Lent with our Lenten Catechesis, this time on the petition of the Lord's Prayer. Oh, the second petition. Haha, <laughs> yes, the second petition, Thy Kingdom Come. God's kingdom is nothing other than we learned in the Creed. God sent his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, into the world to redeem and deliver us from the devil's power, 1 John 3.8. He sent him to bring us to himself and to govern us as a king of righteousness, life and salvation against sin, death, and an evil conscience. For this reason, he has also given his Holy Spirit, who is to bring these things home to us by his holy word and to illuminate and strengthen us in the faith by his power. We pray here in the first place that this may happen with us. We pray that his name may be so praised through God's holy word and a Christian life that we who have accepted it may abide and daily grow in it, and that it may gain approval and acceptance among other people. We pray that it may go forth with power throughout the world, First or Second Thessalonians 3.1. We pray that many may find entrance into the kingdom of grace, John 3.5, be made partakers of redemption, Colossians 1, 12-14, and be led to it by the Holy Spirit, Romans 8.14 so that we may all together remain forever in one kingdom, now begun. In this petition, we pray for an eternal, inestimable treasure and everything God himself possesses. This is far too great for any human heart to think about desiring. If God had not himself commanded us to pray for the same, 
but because he is God. He also claims the honor of giving much more and more abundantly than anyone can understand. Ephesians 3.20 He is like an eternal, unfailing fountain. The more it pours forth and overflows, the more it continues to give. God desires nothing more seriously from us than that we ask him for much and great things. We pray. Everlasting Father, source of every blessing, mercifully direct and govern us by your Holy Spirit that we may complete the works you have prepared for us to do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.